Shalom, brothers and sisters. This is Dr. William Sneblin coming to you again from With One Accord Ministries. And this is another one of our, in our series of Treasure Guardian, Treasure Guardians videos. And this time we are talking about uh, another one of the important feasts of Yahuwah, which is coming up at this time. And that is the Feast of Shavuot or Pentecost, as it's known to uh, Western Christians. Uh, this feast is the fourth of the of the Almighty's feast days, and I want to just direct your 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 attention first of all to a passage that we're going to start with in Leviticus chapter 23 and verse 2, and in there it says, "Speak unto the children of Israel." This is of course Yahuwah speaking, and say unto them concerning the feasts of Yahuwah which ye shall proclaim to be holy covenants. Even these are my feasts. Now notice, contrary to what a lot of people will tell you within commercial Christianity, these are not Jewish feasts. These are not Israelite feasts. These are not old covenant feasts. These are the feasts of Yahuwah. He says they are my feasts. That's scripture. So, you know, this is not about some arcane thing from the past that no longer matters. As we'll see as we dig into the scriptures here, this is something that is fresh and vital and important for us even today. So, without further ado, let's get into this. We're in Leviticus chapter 23, as I mentioned, and starting in verse this, they go through the feasts. And starting with this particular feast, in it's in verse 15. And it says, And ye shall count uh, unto you from the morrow after the Sabbath, in other words, the day after of the Pesach, Passover, from that day ye brought the sheaf of the wave offering, seven Sabbath shall be complete. Even unto the morrow after the seventh Sabbath shall ye number Fifty days, and ye shall offer a new meat offering unto Yahuwah, and ye shall bring out of your habitations two wave loaves of two tenths deals. They shall be of fine flour. They shall be bacon with leaven. They are the first fruits unto Yahuwah, and ye shall offer them with the with the bread seven lambs without blemish of the first year and one young bullock, and two rams. They shall be for a burnt offering unto Yahuwah with their meat offering and their drink offerings, even an offering made by fire of sweet savor unto Yahuwah. Verse 19. Then ye shall sacrifice one kid of the goats for a sin offering, and two lambs of the first year for a sacrifice of peace offering. Then the priest shall wave them with the bread of the first fruits for a wave offering before Yahuwah with the two lambs. They shall be holy to Yahuwah for the priest. And ye shall proclaim on the selfsame day that it be a holy convocation unto you. Ye shall do no servile work therein. It shall be a statute forever in all your dwellings throughout your generations. Okay, now we see there at the very end what I read. This is a this is a statute forever, you know, for Yahuwah's people. So so please bear that in mind as we as we unpack these verses. First of all, <clears throat> understand that the word Shavuot, which is the name of this feast in Hebrew, comes from the Hebrew word Shabbat, which is seven. So we're talking about, as it says, seven Sabbaths. And I'll talk more about what that means in a moment. Now, seven, as many of you know, is a number that's frequently associated with heaven, with the Almighty, and with the things of Yahuwah. Uh, it's his number, and it refers to perfection. So the idea is, from Passover, you count seven weeks, seven Sabbaths, because there's one Sabbath every week, and then you are ready to celebrate the Feast of Shavuot. Now, additionally, this word, both the, again, 
all Hebrew words, almost without exception, come from a three-letter root. And as I've said, Shavuot comes from the Hebrew word Shabbat, which means seven. And both of those words also have a root in another term which references the idea of to make an oath or a solemn promise. And we're going to see how important that is in a couple minutes. So this is 50 days all together. And devout Torah, keep, Torah keeping Israelites will count the Omer, as it says in the Bible, I just read it in Leviticus 23, for 50 days. And that way they arrive at Shavuot. And of course, it's called, in Greek, it's called Pentecost, you know, which means 50. Now, next, the, the verses say we are to bring a meat offering. Now, the Hebrew word for that is mincha, which actually means a donation or a free will offering. And interestingly enough, it's also the word that's used in the Torah for the afternoon prayer service or the afternoon offering that was done every day when the temple stood. Okay, now the other thing we'll notice is that there are two loaves that are leavened. Now, why are there two loaves? Well, there's many theories about that, but I would submit to you that it's partially because they represent Yahushua, who is the bread of life, the Lachem Chaim, and it's his human nature and it's his divine nature, the two loaves. Additionally, you'll notice that now that it is prescribed that they are to be leavened. Now, you recall back at Pesach, we were to go, you know, Pesach and then seven days eating no leaven. And that's because leaven was a symbol of wickedness. Now, though, we are at the Feast of Shavuot and we can have uh, leaven in our bread because it is a sign that Yahushua has taken us past the time of matzah, past the time that we are being purified of our sin and of uh, what in the Hebrew is called the Yetzir Hara. Uh, many uh, Christians call it their sin nature. This is purified during this period of the, of the Feast of Matzah, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And so that's why now at this major feast, we get to offer bread with leaven. Now you'll notice there's seven lambs without blemish that are to be offered. Now, you know, again, I already mentioned the idea of seven, which comes up a lot during this feast, is a number of perfection. It's a number most frequently associated with Yahuwah. So, and of course, the lambs are to be perfect and without blemish. And, you know, most, most people that study the, the Bible know that it is uh, that it's a symbol of Yahushua, who is the Lamb of Yahuwah, the Sehayah, who took away the sins of the world for us. So, you know, between the seven, the perfection, and the idea of a lamb, here again we see the symbolism of Yahushua entering into the feast of Shavuot. Hallelujah. Now, we also see there are other animals involved. There is a bullock, two rams, and goats. Now, all of these animals are symbols of the evil one. I mean, you know, most students of history understand that down through the centuries, all the way back to Egypt and even before that, the bull was one of the primary symbols of, of the evil one, of Ha-Satan, you know, Lucifer. And at the same time, uh, rams are also used to this day. I mean, I when I was a devil worshiper many, many years ago, I belonged to a church that was called the Order of the Black Ram. And they were hardcore devil worshipers. And then, of course, goats, that's another thing. We just talked in the last video we made about the symbol of Baphomet, the goat of Mendes, which, which is a being that's like a human being with the head of a goat. So all of these things are to be sacrificed as a symbol that, that sin is being destroyed in the world, that sin is being destroyed in our lives by the power of Yahushua and his shed blood. Uh, they're utterly defeated by Yahushua on Calvary. Oh, now they're offering, it says, they're being offered with the other animals with the lamb and the lamb will make them set apart. 
Now, the other thing that's very, very important to understand is it says that it's a holy convocation. Now, the word there in Hebrew is, is not as well known. The word for convocation is mikra, and it comes from the Hebrew root kara, uh, which means to be called out. So it's interesting because a lot of people understand that when we read the apostolic writings in the New Testament, and we see the word church in, in, in Greek, that's ekklesia. And that also means to be called out. So realize that in the, in the ancient um, paths of Israel, that there were mikre. There were these holy convocations where the people were called out to be set apart and they were invited. See, they were invited by Yahuwah to come and gather with him, to come, if you will, and party with him on his set-apart days. And to this very day, <clears throat> excuse me, he is making that invitation to us. So, you know, the thing I guess I want to emphasize here is that there's this very common teaching, which is not in the scripture, where it's where people say, oh, well, Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 is the birthday of the church. Well, it doesn't say that. In fact, there was a church, if you will, a mikrah, back in the days of Moses. It is even talks about in the New Testament, the church in the wilderness. This is not a New Testament idea. The idea of being a set-apart, holy congregation is a mikrah, or plural mikre, and it means you're to be called out. And so this is, this is Yahuwah giving us an invitation to come and gather with him, to party with him on this special day, and we're going to talk about why it's special in a moment. Okay, this is a set-apart gathering for the covenant family of Yahuwah. Now, the, the next thing we read is it is a Shabbat, what's called a high Shabbat. Uh, it, it may or may not fall on, on the actual Sabbath day, weekly Sabbath, but the point is it is a high Sabbath and we are to not do any ordinary work. Uh, the King James says any servile work. We are to just concentrate on the, the Torah, read the scriptures, fellowship with our family and other believers and just enjoy ourselves on this day with him. Okay, finally, and I noted this earlier, but it says it is an everlasting covenant between Yahuwah and his people. So this is not something that's old or outdated. This is everlasting. And of course, we know what Yahushua said in Matthew 5, 17 to 19, that, that the heaven and the earth would pass away, but these these teachings, the, his law, his Torah will not pass away. So, the other thing we go to for this is Deuteronomy 16. And in Deuteronomy 16, and that's we're going to start in verse 9 through 11. Again, this is somewhat repetitive, but I want to just highlight a couple different things. Because again, Yahweh never says anything without reason in his word. And he spends a lot of time on these feast days. And in fact, some many people have said it. There's only one verse in the Bible that says he must be born again. And yet there's literally hundreds of verses in the Bible discussing his tabernacle, his feast days, his Sabbath, his ordinances. And, you know, it shows what's important to him. So starting in verse 9, seven weeks shalt thou number unto thee. Begin to number the seven weeks from such time as thou beginnest to put the sickle into the, into the corn. And thou shalt keep the feast of weeks, um, of sevens, uh, unto Yahuwah thy Elohim, with the tribute of a free will offering of thy hand, which thou shalt give unto Yahuwah thy Elohim, according as Yahuwah thy Elohim has blessed thee. This is important. Verse 11, And thou shalt rejoice with Yahuwah thy Elohim, Thou and thy son and thy daughter and thy manservant and thy maidservant, and the Levite that is within thy gates, and the stranger and the fatherless and the widow that are among you, in the place which Yahuwah thy Elohim has chosen to place his, chosen to place his name there. So we see there that the two things. One is the word that's used there 
for feast is the word chag. And, and it, it literally means a party. It means a celebration. It doesn't mean something all solemn where everybody sits around like, you know, they just lost their best friend. It's supposed to be a festival. It's supposed to be a time of partying. And we're, the word there is to rejoice. To rejoice. And you see with, a, with a, your family, your friends, your maidservants, everybody. And, you know, that is, that is what this is all about. It's to rejoice. To rejoice in Yahuwah on this day. Now, why is this so? And one other thing I want to mention, and that is we are at this time to remember the poor and the needy and the fatherless and the widow and the orphan. During this time, people that might not have family or friends to rejoice with, try and remember them in, in, in your, your festivities if that's at all possible. Now, the other thing is if you go back to the original feast in the, in the Torah, of this of, of Shavuot, 50 days after they left Egypt, Moses took the people out of Egypt. You will see that that is when they got the Torah. That was when Yahweh himself came down on Mount Sinai and spoke the 10 words, the 10 statements, which in Christianity we're accustomed to call commandments, but actually most of them aren't commandments, but that's another conversation. The point is, he came down from Mount Sinai and visibly, audibly, not visibly, but audibly spoke his words and they thundered across from the mountaintop and all, all of us, all of our ancestors heard the voice of Yahuwah. Now understand this. This was the day of the wedding between Yahuwah and his people. And they agreed. He spoke these words and then they said, all that the Israelites said, all that Yahuwah has spoken, we will do. But yet they were so terrified by the awesomeness of his voice that they, they said to Moses, they said, don't let him speak any more to us, but we, we want you to speak to us because, you know, we, his voice is just terrifying. And it must have been an amazing experience. So anyhow, the point is, this is a wedding celebration. This is when Yahuwah married Israel. And it's in the, the Torah is his wedding contract with us, his ketubah. It's when he, he basically gave these stipulations, you know, that he was going to take care of us and feed us and, and shelter us and, and love us and gather us into his bosom. And in return, we were supposed to, to guard and to pay close attention to his words and to follow him. And that was, that was why this is such a big feast day. It's, we're celebrating, even today, the fact that, that thousands of years ago, we received the Torah and we became part of Yahuwah's bride. Hallelujah. So this is an amazing thing. Now, the other thing to understand is that the second major Shavuot that's mentioned in the scriptures is, of course, in Acts chapter 2, which is commonly known as the Feast of Pentecost. And when, when Peter got up, and there were all these, and, and again, some people may not have even gotten the fact that the reason there were all these believers, all of these Israelites from all over the world, I mean, the, the chapter even gives a list, you know, Parthians and Medes and all these different people were all gathered to the feast. And when Peter started preaching, because of a special anointing from the Ruach, all these different people, all these different ethnicities heard his words in their native tongue. Now, that's a miracle in itself, but what you need to understand is when, that, when the tongues that were described to be like as a fire fell on the Talmudim, on the disciples in that upper room, that at that moment, they were empowered by the Ruach, by the Holy Spirit, to keep the Torah that was given you know, over a thousand years earlier, they Hallelujah. were empowered to be able to do this. Yahuwah wrote his Torah in their hearts as Jeremiah the prophet prophesied. And that is the point of, there was this endowment of power from on high at that feast, which was the feast of Shavuot um, 2000 years ago. And that was the main thing. And that's why he gave, Peter gave the sermon that he gave 
and why the people said, men and brethren, what shall we do? And he said, repent, you know, do teshuva. That, the, the Hebrew word for repenting is to do teshuva. And, you know, follow, follow Yahushua. So that's the whole point of this. Now, um, the point I want to make, though, is that when you, when you're empowered to keep the Torah, it's kind of like, if you will, the Ruach comes down and gives you a garment, a wedding garment. Just like, you know, the bride is clothed in her glorious white raiment, well, we, we are clothed in the garment of light, which is the Torah, given us by the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit. And when we get that, that invigorates us and it empowers us. And to my mind, this explains a kind of mysterious place in, in, in one of Yahushua's parables where he talks about the wedding garment. And you'll hear 20 different preachers give 20 different speculative things about what this might have been. But see, if you understand the meaning of the Feast of Shavuot and how it's a celebration of a wedding, you would get a better idea of what Yahushua was talking about. In this parable, it's in Matthew 22, 11 and 12. He says this, you know, at the end of this wedding story, and he says, when the king came in to see the guests, and these were people that he had brought out from the highways and the hedges because the people he originally uh, had invited were, couldn't be bothered to come. And it says that he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment. And he saith unto him, Friend, how camest thou in hither not having a wedding garment? And he, meaning the man, was speechless. Now, a lot of people over the years, and I remember even when I was in, in seminary, people would say, well, that doesn't seem fair. I mean, he hauls this guy in off the street. He's poor. You know, he, he might be like even a homeless individual. And yet he's being castigated for not having a wedding garment. I would submit to you that's because the wedding garment is spiritual. It's not a physical garment. It's spiritual. It's being clothed in the garment of light. It's being clothed in the Torah. And anybody can do that. Anybody can keep the commandments of Yahweh. Okay. You don't have to be rich. You don't have to be powerful. You know, you can be a humble individual with little means and still be faithful to him. So... It, it is, I will tell you, it is the wedding garment that he's talking about is Yahushua. Because if you've heard me teach on the idea of the armor of Yahuwah, I talk about how it's kind of our, our hazmat suit. It's like we're being covered in Yahushua. From the crown, you know, the, um, the helmet of salvation all the way down to the sandals of the gospel of Shalom. We're being covered in him. And he is the living Torah. It says in John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Yahushua is the Word, the Dabar, the living Torah. Walking around on the earth back then, you know, 2,000 years ago, to teach us how to walk and how to live as his Talmudim, as his disciples. Now, here's something else you need to understand as we get bring this to a close. The fact of the matter is, Yahushua, when he, when he gives us his wedding garment, he is placing the yoke upon us, his yoke. And I'm sure many of you know the passage. It was very profound in my life as I was coming to know Moshiach. Uh, in Matthew 11, where he says, in verse 28, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. And back then, as well as today, many people that keep Torah are common. They commonly refer to it as a yoke. But not the yoke that Peter warned about, you know, that nobody could bear, because that was the Pharisaical takanot, the Pharisaical rules that they made up, not his laws. Because John the Apostle says in his epistle that his commandments are not grievous. So Yahushua says, take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly of heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And right. the point is, when you if you understand historically what a yoke is, a yoke was something they would put like two oxen 
or two horses, most commonly oxen in, to pull or to plow a field or something like that. And he's saying, I'm going to be yoked with you. I'm going to pull this load with you. I am going to pick the Torah up. I'm going to pick you up. And I'm going to carry you all the way to the finish line, all the way to the kingdom, all the way until Hallelujah. I decide to call you home. And that's why the yoke is light, is because he's carrying it. We don't have to carry it. He empowers us. So we don't have to we don't have to worry about, you know, oh, can I can I resist temptation? Can I do this? Can I do that? The feast of Shavuot empowers us. And that's the point of it. We are wrapped in his Torah, his garment of light, and it helps keep us walking as Yahushua wants us to walk in his halakha, his way, his teaching. Now, to summarize this, the, 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 the spring feast, we have Pesach or Passover. When you do that, you come into covenant with him. When you keep matzah and don't eat unleavened bread for that period after Passover for seven days, that cleanses us of all our sin. When you keep the, the feast of Bikurim, first fruits, that is when he adopts us into his family and we become his firstborn children. That's what the word Bikurim, it comes from the word Bikor, which means to be firstborn. So we become Yahweh's firstborn children, along, of course, with Yahushua, who is his only begotten son. And then finally, Shavuot, after 50 days of preparation of counting the Omer, we receive the Torah and the garment of light, the endowing of set-apart power to, for us to be able to walk as tis Talmidim and to witness, because again, you know, recall the disciples back in Acts chapter 2, they were empowered to go forth and witness about the wonderful things that Yahushua had done for them in, in their lives. So we are empowered to walk as he walked and to testify about the power of the cross and the power of Yahushua. And that's the whole point of this feast. So it's coming up very soon, but it's not, it's not a complicated thing to do. I, I kind of explained to you what is in the scriptures. So I would exhort those of you that listen to please keep his feasts because that's how we are empowered to walk the way he wants us to walk and to, to be able to transform this world for Moshiach, for Yehushua the Messiah. Now, I would close by saying, please, if you find this video edifying and educational, please like it, please share it, and please subscribe, and also please pray for our ministry and pray about becoming a partner in terms of donations. Thank you very much, and have a, have a blessed Feast of Shavuot. Shalom.